Welcome to Loco Gringo, Mexico, where we can take you beyond the usual on your vacation. Each week, we talk with amazing locals who know the Riviera Maya and Yucatan like only locals can. Get real tips to real places, insights on the local scene, culture, and cuisine from a local's perspective. So pour yourself a margarita, mezcal, or tequila, grab yourself a comfy chair, and let's get the show going. Hola, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. So glad you're joining us today. My name is Kay Walton, and I'm your host of Loco Gringo Mexico. Well, we're going to be speaking to someone who I'm just thrilled that he gave us the opportunity to chat today. Um, his name is Otto van Bertrop, and he is an author, but he is also the person who discovered Rio Secreto. For those of you who do not know about Rio Secreto, it is here in the Riviera Maya, south of Playa del Carmen, and around around Escaret, if that gives you a frame of reference, if you're familiar with the Riviera Maya. And Rio Secreto is... Um, it is a, a cave system, and this cave system has both dry and um, wet parts of the cave and little submerged uh, areas where the, they've explored. And you can go and experience it while you're here. So it is it is a bit of a, a an, it's an, an ecotourism experience for sure. And Otto is going to share with us all the um, efforts that they have going on at Rio Secreto, which I'm just thrilled about, not only... Um, low impact tourism, but talking about conservation and um, community involvement and his appreciation for the Mayan communities. He's going to share all of that with us today, and he's going to give you some insights and some things you shouldn't miss, aside from Rio Secreto, on your next trip here to the Riviera Maya. This episode is brought to you by Buy Playa. You know, lots of people ask us for information and help when it comes to real estate, whether they're looking for retirement, an investment property, or maybe they're looking to relocate to the area. And we refer them over to our friends at Buy Playa. The folks at Buy Playa we've known for years, and they'll make sure that you, the buyer, are fully protected and informed when it comes to buying real estate. So if you're looking to buy a piece of paradise, check out our friends at buyplaya.com. Good afternoon. How are you? Fine, fine, fine. Kate here at, at the Rivera Maya, as always, working. Oh, I know, I know. I, you know, Otto, I, I really, I'm thrilled to have you on the show today, and I can't believe that you're an author. You've published what four books? Is that correct? Only four. Only four. I, I've written sixteen books, uh, but there, are, I've only published four till now. Uh, the other 11 are, are still on my notebook and they're still waiting for me to go back on them and, and, and work on them. Yeah, but writing, it's, it has, it's my lifetime passion. Oh, that's awesome. So being an author and originally from Mexico City, um, how did you wind up here in the Riviera Maya? What brought you to the, to the coast? Well, it's, it's a really long story. I'm, I'm a 49-year-old person, and I'm a Mexican. I was born in Mexico City, as you know. And actually, when Cancun was first opened 40 years ago, I was nine. I, was, I actually was eight when I came here the first. No, I was nine. I came to the area, to the first hotel in Cancun. It was the, the Presidente Hotel. It was right when you start the, the Cancun Hotel zone. So mm -hmm. in that in that journey, we came in car from Mexico City, and we well we crossed all the country and we stopped at different Maya sites, Palenque especially. We went to Uxmal, to Chichen, and well I remember listening to the Maya language then that I did not know, and it attracted me. And well, all the places that we passed, it, it, it they stayed on my memory, and and then. My life continued, and when I was 17, that I, grow up, I, I could travel alone with friends, of course, I had the chance to come to Akumal. A friend of mine had uh, a person, a parent in Akumal, uh, Leticia Cordova, that you might know. Oh, I, yeah, I know and, her. Yeah, so well, he told me, hey, we, I, there's a bungalow there. Uh, my aunt is not, she's on vacation, so we can stay there for a couple of weeks, no charge. So we drove from Monterey. I was living in the north of Mexico then. And so we drove all the way and stayed in Nacomal 
for a couple of weeks, and it was great. I mean, in that time, oh, Cancun was already growing. There was no playa. Playa was just the Quinta Avenida, third road. And Akumal, it was what you must have known. It was a, a small, uh, not tourist, it was more like a, a, um, a colony, a statement. <laughs> and, but, and I remember perfectly from Akumal, well, we had the chance to go to uh, Punta Soliman, where, where there were uh, manatees. I remember they told us there were manatees there, so we snorkeled looking for manatees. Did you see any? For- Did you see any no, manatee? No, not in that time, but I just, <laughs> just imagining there could be. It was enough of an excitement for, for me to remember it yet still. And actually, <laughs> Punta Soliman, that place, it's still uh, as it was then. It, it's, it's, it's virgin. There's no houses, no development there. And in that in that journey, we also when we say that it was by Yatia Mujil, that it was now it's I think it's a hotel, but then it was a, a camp. It was a Lalo. He was like a sort of yep. a captain. He has a big beard, and and he rented you or or bungalows, or he let you camp there. We stayed there for a while. We went Kate to Scaret when Scaret wasn't there. It it was it was just a cenote that was close to the sea, and so you could do. Uh, a couple of uh, short dives, and you could enter from the sand, fresh waters, and not to the sea. And but there was no park, no. It, it was just a, a public cenote. And uh, and well, we when we saw cenotes, we loved cenotes, and we started going to any cenotes we could, and they were all marvelous. And and well, since we were staying in Akumar, we also went, as you must know, to Yalku. Uh, this was. 30 years ago when Yalku was, was a, a garden, uh, an underwater paradise. I mean, it still is, but 30 years ago it was, I think it was more, it was better. So, well, in that trip then, I said to, actually, I remember I went back home and I had to decide to go to college. You know, it was that time after when you're finishing high school. And I told my parents, I don't want to study. I want to go back to, to Akuma, to, to the Riviera, and I want to stay there. And, you know, they told me, you're crazy, you know, go to university and forget about your journeys. And, and well, the truth is I went to the university, but I, I couldn't keep out of my mind the, the idea of living in the, um, in the Maya region. I loved all the Maya region from the Maya Riviera, but all of the... Yucatan Peninsula and the Chiapas area, the state of Chiapas area, even Guatemala. I mean, I, I really got a, fell in love with the Maya people and with their culture and with their tradition and their ways. And, and also with cenotes. So, so cenotes for me uh, were, it's the most beautiful place on earth because, you know, it's they're crystal clear, they're fresh. I mean, in an environment, where it's usually hot, warm, a lot of sun, the cenotes, it's like glory. And so, uh, uh, and so I, I came several times vacationing, traveling more than vacationing. And it, it, they get, it was one point I started writing. Well, I, I, you know, I finished university, then I went to college. I put a business, I, I mean, I, I put a business. And one day I said, I don't want to do this business anymore. I want to, I want to live with the Maya communities. And so I went and living in Chiapas area. Chiapas, you know, there's mountains. And there I started to write. And I, I, my writings are, they're not exactly about the Mayas, but they're like the Mayas te- tell their stories. That they involve a lot of fantasy, a lot of myths. And, and so I, for seven years, I just wrote and wrote and I traveled a lot through Mexico and through North America. I was in my motorcycle just driving all around having a the best time really. Uh, I, and, and in that period, in those seven years, it's when I wrote most of my books. But as you can imagine, they got to a point where, where I was broke and I needed to work. Well, I got some works, you know. And, and a friend of mine was coming to the area, to Playa El Carmen, he was gonna put a, a tour company that's called Alternative. And he called me and said, hey, let's go. And I said, I'm there. And I arrived in Playa del Carmen and he told me, uh, well, actually, it was uh, Leti's son, Rodrigo. Mm-hmm. Yep. He told me, we found a beautiful community in the jungle that you must know. And he took me, the day I got here, he took me to this community that's called Pakchen. 
Yes. And, and when I got there, there was a cenote. We were pelt down. I, I brought my ropes and my, you know, my adventure equipment with me. And and then we I put a zip line in another cenote. And I said to Rodrigo, I want to stay here. And I'm going to design the tour for you guys, for, for, for this new company. And I stayed there. I stayed in that community. I designed this uh, eco-tourist activities and started guiding. And then I... I involved the community. I, I became part of that small village and it gave training to, to the people and helped them organize in order to, to, to make the ecotourism project work. And, and well, that's how I got here. And it was a dream come true for me because I really wanted to live among the Mayas, but I really wanted to do something for them. And so it was all perfect they, with ecotourism, bring job to them, uh, uh, pre- help them uh, a way to preserve their traditions. And, and so in Pakchen, Pakchen is, is still there. We started that project uh, 17 years ago. Wow. Until now it's working as, as it was first designed with low volume and uh, with a great service and nature. And the, the thing is, we, through that community project, what we did and we're still still doing it's preserving nature and and from Paten, then we opened another um, tour in Tres Reyes another community nearby this is all in the Coba area and while we started growing and open, opening more tours and eventually I found Rio Secreto that's where I'm now that Rio Secreto I don't, I don't know if you know it Kate you know what you I do know Rio? I have not been there in many years. I was there when it very when it opened early on, and we probably have met um, somewhere along the line. That was around uh-huh. 2006, wasn't it, that you found it? Yes, exactly, exactly. And yeah, I, I think you guys came, yeah. And well, Rio Secreto, as you might remember, it's wow. No, it's it's, it's beautiful. My description then was uh, all of the cenotes I knew. If you put them together, it's half of what Rio Secreto is. Rio Secreto is like the most beautiful, especially beautiful because it's, it, it's aesthetic a cave in the world. You know, it, it's really amazing. And so when, when I had the opportunity to discover this place through an invitation of a, an ejidatario, a, an ejidatario is one of the landowners, say, he invited me to, to get to know his, his ranch and, and his cave. But when, when we saw it, we said, when I, I went in, I said, it's beautiful, but it's small. But in the corner, we saw it followed. And so then the next day we went in and, and, and followed that small path. And it guided us to this huge gallery and then to another huger gallery. And it took us one year just to get to know the whole cave system. That's actually a flooded cave. So it's a huge cave system with pools with uh, the underground uh, water pools, crystal clear water pools. It's an amazing place. So that's my passion now. That's, that's where I'm, my project here is uh, preserving as it was in Pak Chen, that it was a preserving project, preservation. Here it's the same, but uh, the battle is a bit more intense because uh, Rio Secreto is right. It's really close to Playa del Carmen. And as you know, Playa del Carmen is growing and growing and growing. And so we're trying to keep the city uh, in control, but that's, that's hard. But uh, we managed to, through, through, through contracts with landowners and through getting involved in, in local politics and in regulations and in water protection uh, policies, we, we're managing to, to create a, a natural reserve, to create all of this area a natural reserve so that it's preserved as we found, as I found it uh, 10 years ago only, as it is, because it, it's gorgeous. I mean, Rio Secreto is gorgeous as Yalcú is gorgeous as Xcaret was gorgeous as, as every, all the area is gorgeous. But if we, if we don't take care of it, if we keep growing as, as we are, uh, it, it's on risk. And that's have- my worry. I have a question for you. I know, it, you know, there's uh-huh. some things in, as the area develops, there's some things that you, that you can't control. I mean, you know, there's some things, of course, you can do um, within, you know, talking to the city of Playa and everything. But what is Rio Secreto? What are you, what, what have you 
taken on as initiatives to promote sustainable tourism and to offer up um, an, an experience for guests to come and visit and be very low impact when they're there? Yes. Well, actually, since since I discovered it, I was looking for a tourist place uh, because that was my job, you know. And and I, uh, as I was passing through those galleries, I said, well, this place, it's untouched. We have to keep it as it is. And whoever we bring in, he has to feel as if it was me right now exploring this. And so all the plan is based on that, is based on whoever comes, He's going to feel like he's the first one there. And so we designed different routes. That that was a geological quality of the place. It has many exits. And so the routes we do or the traverses we do, it always enters in one area and traverse and exits through another. And we make small groups of maximum 10 people. And we make sure there have separations between groups of at least 10 minutes. And so every group is by his own in this huge cave, does not see anyone else. And with this criteria, we decided not to build anything inside of the cave. We we did not put railways, no paths, no. The cave is just as it is. The, our only control is threats, line threats, as of divers use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we put two lines, and, and you go in between the lines, and, and that's, uh, the only the path that we mark and also we we have very strict regulation our inner regulation that we since the, the, the visitor comes we tell him you have to take a shower you have to go to the restroom you have to take everything out we even lie and tell them that there's laws that prohibit anyone from touching the the speleothems or taking anything from the cave we're really strict uh, because it's really worth it. Maybe the visitors say, oh, this is exaggeration. But when they see what's inside, when they see this marvelous caves, they understand. They say, wow, yeah, this place, it's not, it's a, uh, we call it, uh, our mission is to be a, a, a human patrimony. We believe that this place, as all of the cenote, should be kept for humanity and for the future. They're, I mean, for one, they're the source of, source of water for the region. And for the other, they're so beautiful that, and, and, and have so much information on them that, that we have to keep it. For example, we also have, since we started, we started uh, letting uh, scientists come in uh, from universities and from local groups to do research. And in, in Rio Secreto, they have found, because, you know, all the geology history of mm-hmm. the Earth, it's, it's on caves. I mean, especially the, the levels of the sea, uh, how the glass, the ice ages and the warmings of the planet, they all have been written on the caves. They're there. You can see it. You can understand the today's topography by knowing this process of thousands of years, millions of years of, of, the, uh, of the climate of the earth. And so we're starting to, through this cave, through the studies in this caves, we're starting to understand a lot of things. For example, in Rio Secreto, they just at uh, uh, the University the Amber College of Massachusetts. We have uh, with them um, a contract that we're working together. They're just uh, published a paper where they define uh, with with a lot of arguments and with a lot of proofs that the Maya civilization, the classical period, left uh, or was dispersed because of a drought. And they measured this drought through the uh, carbon studies to a sample of a stalagmite that, uh, from Rio Secreto. And there, you know, the stalagmites as, as trees, if you slice them, you have these arrows. Mm-hmm. And those arrows uh, measure, as, as in trees, the, the different rain age. seasons and the dry seasons, age. And so through this study of one stalagmite, they could, over, I mean, they will force different style of mines, but they could determine that in the classical period, in the end of the classical Maya period, you know, the year 1,900, 1,000, there was a, a extensive drought. And so that that's a proof that that was the reason why the Mayas scattered in that time. 
And, and well, that's only one of the findings. There's also several findings really important. For example, uh, you visit any cave in, especially in Mexico, but in, in many parts of the world, and the guide always tell you, no, uh, a stalactite, it goes one centimeter each 10 years, no? They, they have like this formula. Mm -hmm. But these studies we're doing showed that that's not the case, that every stalagmite has a different rate of growth. We, we've studied stalagmites, stalactites that have taken uh, hundreds of years to grow one centimeter, and some stalagmites that have grown in years, in, in several years, just a few years. And it, 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 it has, there's so many different factors that we did not understand, that, but we're finding out now with this research that we're doing on, on Rio Secreto Cave. And, the, and well, wow. yeah, yeah, tell me, Kate. No, I, I, I mean, it's, it really, it does, it, and it's all common sense in terms of thinking about the stalactites, um, is that they're, they would grow differently depending on, you know, air movement in the cave, the, the amount of rainwater from the surface. There's so many factors. And then the geological composition of the, mm -hmm. the, the earth above them. So it makes perfect sense that, that to measure them and that the, the growth is not, you can't have a blanket statement that says, Oh, they only grow mm -hmm. one centimeter um, because it would vary for sure. Yes, um, that, yes. That's, that's fascinating that they're studying the cave, the cave there because it's a very important. It's a beautiful environment. Um, but we need to learn a lot. We need to learn more about the cave systems in, in the Yucatan. Yes. Actually right now, other studies that we're having, for example, uh, well, uh, this, there's a, a doctor, she's from Canada, she's on the Illinois University, she's called Patricia Beddows. I know, know her. her, yeah, I know Patricia. Yeah. Well, she goes, yeah, a lot to Akuma. Well, she brings every year or every semester, she comes, she brings students and do, do field works. But she has, in Rio Secreto, different um, equipment on. And she's studying right now two things, well, three things. One is uh, called the uh, cars rafts that's uh, uh when in a when in a water surface there's no movement mm -hmm. there's like a calcium raft that forms it's like an ice like yes, a nice uh, cap yeah and so patricia has uh, cameras in certain areas and she's seeing how they form and and she, she's the first one to have information about this uh, geological formation she's also making uh, uh some work yes I, I love this one because in, in the case in the Yucatan, especially in Rio Secreto, since they're, they're horizontal caves mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're not really deep, we get a lot of roots into the cave. So all the uh, uh, geological formations you see, they're not all made by gravity or by erosion as usual. Some are eccentric and are made by roots because roots yep. go in and so suddenly the, the calcium it sticks to the roots, and so suddenly you have in a cave, you know, like a a, 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 a speleothem that has cures on it, like organic, and 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 so it's because of the roots. So there, there's so many factors. The, the other one that Patricia is studying too is the intrusion of salt into the uh, into the freshwater system, and and this we see it, for example, with the the level of the of the sea the sea tides that mm -hmm. it influenced in the inside cenotes. So whenever the, the, the tide goes up and down, the cenotes go up and down, not as much as the sea, but some. And, and, and so you can see a connection. The other is the, the salt intru intru intrusion. We know that uh, closer to the sea, uh, the salt water is close by. Sometimes like in, in, in the area of, of the Highway, for example, or the cenotes that are near Acomal in, in Puerto Aventuras, the salt layer is like 12 meters below the, because it's uh, the top, the surface, that's the lens of, of clear water, of um, fresh water, and then the, the hollow climb that's in between, and then the salt water. And as you go further inland, for example, in Pakchen, Pakchen is 50 kilometers inland, there the the lens of fresh water is around 25 meters. And, and there's always a risk if the sea level came up with a warming, a global warming, for example, then that salt inclusion could affect 
all these uh, underground freshwater rivers. And, and well, there's a lot of study to be done there, and it's a really important work because from that could uh, manage life in this area. If, if we get salt inclusion to the cenotes, maybe one day we wouldn't have uh, fresh water in, the, in Quintana Roo. So all this is going on, and, and well, our other uh, environmental or more social effort is since we started Rio Secreto, we noticed that we needed to do work with the community. We needed to convince the population that we have to preserve water. And to preserve water, I mean also the jungle and the animals in the jungle because it's all connected. And so we, we organized this organization, non-lucrative organization, that's called Sentinelas del Agua. It's, it's Sentinels of the Water. And, and this is a group of, of actually their teachers, it's a group of women uh, that are doing, their main work is doing environmental education in local schools. And so we, we've designed um, uh, in, in Rio Secreto an area for them so we bring children from schools and we take, them, we take them to Rio Secreto and show them the importance of water and of, of conservation for the life on this area of the planet. And, and, and we have like a method uh, of showing this that we can also take two schools. And, and also Sentinela, she's, that's the arm that's also participating in lo- local pol- policy making. And we're trying to push hard on this um, geological, geo-hydrological reserve that different studies have uh, concluded that in order to preserve the water in this area, uh, our natural reserve needs to be uh, decredited in this reserve so that water can be kept. And so we're pushing this with the, with the idea that all of the cenotes and underground rivers can be considered as biological corridors so that fauna uh, uh, can uh, transit through this uh, uh, reserves or network of, of biological corridors. And, and when those corridors pass through cities, for example, Playa del Carmen, what we're trying to promote is that in the, in the urban development, they leave uh, linear, linear parks, so extend parks uh, that cross the cities so that uh, fauna can transit too. So uh, it's a dream we're fighting for, and we, we, we've got somewhere, we've advanced. Uh, this, this concept now it's included in, in part of the, the local plants, and so we're, we're, try, we're trying to do our best effort, and, and uh, since we started, that was our purpose. It's preservation through ecotourism, but uh, our, our goal is a bit higher. It's not only conserving, preserving Rio Secreto, but helping uh, make a network or framework so that all of the cenotes in the area can be preserved. That, that's yeah. our, our goal and our effort, an everyday effort. And every person that comes and visits Rio Secreto in a way, in a very direct way, is contributing to this uh, fight or this effort. Oh, man. Uh, kudos to, to you, Otto, and, and everybody on at Rio Secreto for this, because it's very important. You know, I'm, I moved here when I was here in 1992. I came here to explore the cenotes, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very precious area that we live in. It's very unique um, in the world, yeah. and it, it really, it really demand, it really requires, and especially because, as you mentioned, water, water is a very valuable um, nece- necessity, Absolutely. and because we have no surface rivers um, here in the Yucatan Peninsula, that water running underground is is crucial to to all forms of life, not only us humans, but as you said, you know, the trees, the jungle, the animals, and everything. It is very, it is, is it a critical. A, con- a critical um, element Asian. that we all need, and we need, and we need to have respect for it. And I think sometimes um, we we kind of take it for granted, and uh, we really need to appreciate the uh, appreciate the environment for what it is, and that it's very special and worth protecting. Yes, yes, we believe that that 
we're not alone. You know, we're a group in, in Rio Secreto now. We're, a, we're more than a hundred people who work here, and we're all compromised with this. But we know that, that there's a, a big part of the community that's uh, that's um, compromised with with this effort, and it, and we have to we have to really because it, it's a matter of of preservation not only of the of the species and of the jungles. It's a preservation of ourselves, our, our future generations. It's especially, well, thinking of, of of us who have kids. As we're going, Kate, I mean, our kids are not gonna be able to see uh, jungles or, or know that there's jaguars around and, and least of all have the quality of water that we have. So it's, it's for me, it's, an emergency that we need to work together because as we are working in Rio Secreto, we know that there's different ONGs and different people working on, on that same di direction and and it's worth it. It's worth it because uh, in, in a sense, we're not going the right way in, in the environmental sense. We, we've done so much harm because the truth is greed, human greed or sometimes ignorance, but if we can... Uh, uh, change that through information or through sustainable projects which are not focused only in, in the in the green in the money making but are, but have also the the social factor and the conservation factor we, we hope we can uh, perm like uh, i hope that many companies and many hotels and people who work and live in the area uh, can get those concepts um in the processes, because I mean, there's good ways to do things. You can you can work and and not do harm, but mm -hmm. sometimes if you don't take care of things, you do the same work but harm. So it's just we need to change the culture, uh, help change the culture, and, and wow. we're all on that cave, I believe. That that's absolutely incredible. Um, I, I'm just, I, I mean, I'm taken back. I, I mean, you know, I had known um, about Rio Secreto and everything, but to learn the extent of everything that you guys are doing um, towards research and sustainability and environmental protection, my hat's off to you guys. I'm just, I'm, I'm just in awe of everything that you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and you're, you're welcome to join the airport or, on the other hand, whenever there's a need, uh, we participate, you know, we here with the municipality, they tell us there's a cenote that need to go clean in Puerto Aventura. All the Rio Secreto personnel enjoys going and cleaning. We, we do that a lot too. We try to, to, to help out in, in the community. So, oh, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah, please let us know. You know what? We get some of, we get our local gringo staff together and we can go out and do uh -huh. a little team effort with, uh, with all of you guys from Rio Secreto. That would be a lot of fun. Yes, yes. Whenever you want, because we're we're for that. We like that, okay. And and and, and joining effort is the, is the best way. More people Absolutely. join. Absolutely. <laughs> Otto, I have a question for you. Do you have some Do you have some tips or recommendations for people who want to come to the area? How they can have a more authentic experience or have an experience where it is low impact on the environment or in the community and things like that. Any insights that you can share? Well, <laughs> obviously, my, in my personal experience, uh, the, the most beautiful places are usually you have to you have to get away from the big urban areas, and then and stop at small communities. You know, in in the Yucatan Peninsula, the people are very honest. They're very friendly. I mean, very very friendly, and and so. For me to advise someone who's coming to the area it would be just, you know, get a car, rent a car and drive through small roads and stop at small communities and, and ask to see what they have and they will open their houses for you and they will show you something beautiful because there's beautiful things on every corner. Every town in the Yucatan Peninsula, it's settled around a cenote, a well, a water well. And that well, it's actually a cenote, so it's a beautiful place, and and so and and that's also helping you know the the communities because what's happening in the area is that you know there's this Cancun big city, there's now Playa del Carmen or Riviera Maya, and so all of the people from villages 
have had to come and work in these big urban areas now. And so they need work. They need, you know, people to visit. They, um, and, and they need to preserve and to go back to their homeland. And, and, and there's so many beautiful things all around. I mean, any road you take, especially, for example, from Tulum, if you go south from Tulum, that's where the Mayan oh, area starts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you go small roads and these small Maya community villages, and the people, you know, they smile. They're, they're, the human quality of the area, I believe it's m- even more important. There are natural assets because uh, this Maya culture is an ancient culture. And, and they not only smile because they're innocent or because they like to laugh, they smile because they have this tradition of laughing that's part of their culture since generations. And, and after you uh, live with them, you start, you start smiling too. And, and, and you, you take that, you learn how to see life in the way they do. So if, you, if any tourist can get that, it's really valuable. It will, it will change their lives. So that will be my my tip for anyone coming to the Maya Peninsula, to the Yucatan Peninsula, is getting to know the Mayas, the real Mayas, the ones that are in small communities. And, and they could be found from in the area of Tulum South or Tulum West to Coba or, or going towards Merida. Yeah, they're all around. And, and that's... That, that's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And usually people don't see that. No, it's very, I just actually, a couple of weeks ago, I drove, I was south on the highway headed towards Carrillo Porto, and I took the road that goes to Chimpon. And I remember when that was just, a, I remember when that was just a sock bay or a, a dirt road. And it was amazing. I drove and drove. I never got to the end of it. I had to turn around before I ran out of gas. Um, but yeah. it, it just went, but I went, it was beautiful to go through these little pueblos. And actually for me, cause I hadn't seen them in about 15 years, um, how they had evolved and how they had grown with the times, but very friendly people, um, and it was just a, be- a beautiful sight to see. And actually, I have to find they were farming some plant. It looked like a cactus. Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure what their agriculture was there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, to go out and visit the small pueblos really gives a nice insight to to the culture of the area, which is just, it, it's beautiful. And you know, people think, oh, the ancient Maya. Well, we still have Maya, um, the modern day Maya. Yeah. And, and it's, re- it's really, they're really it's very friendly, warm people to interact with they're and to get to know. Beautiful people. And especially that area. For example, that road you took to Chumpon. Yep. You can follow it. And you know, that's, that road is one of the only ones that have curves, you know. It's beautiful for motorcycling, for example. And, and there, it, from Chumpon, you could go to Coba. Now there's a road that you could go to Coba. Oh. And so that's like a beautiful, maybe two hour drive or more. But actually, it's not a, a drive. You, you have to stop at every town because every town, just to, you know, to drink some water in the local store, and you make you make friends. You make friends there. And there's now now there's a network of of uh, roads in that area. For example, for someone who likes to bike, that's great because there's hardly any cars there. Hardly any cars. So it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. And for me, that's the best part of the peninsula. Definitely. I mean, I love the beach. I love cenotes. But going to towns with the Maya people, that, as you said, is it's it's a lifetime. It's it, it, there's no other place in the world where you can have that experience. Well, maybe in Guatemala, <laughs> but, but the Yucatecs are nice. The Yucatecs are nice. Oh, the Yucatecans are beautiful people. Wonderful. I love them all. Um, Otto, I I have loved talking with you, and I hope you will come back on the show and keep us up to speed with what's going on at Rio Secreto. Um, we, I love hearing about all these projects. It's fascinating. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. You always, I'm always here, and and you're always welcome to come to see oh, what we're doing, and, and invite every, anyone who wants to come, and, and and we'll do things together. We'll at least we'll clean us in the in some urban area. Oh, maybe, that would be great. Maybe in the Akumal town or in Puerto Ventura town. <laughs> um, All right. Now, how can people how can people contact you if they want to find out more about your environmental efforts or your research or even to come to Rio Secreto? What's the best way to reach you or to reach someone there? Well, in, in riosecreto.com, our website, 
uh, there you can uh, there's there's a link to our blog where we put all the information and there you could buy our, our tools and, and get more information uh, our newsletter is there or also at our Facebook um, uh, site you know the Rio Secreto Natural Reserve or Rio Secreto Reserva Natural and and there you'll see you know we have also Twitter we have all the social media and there we're we're trying to to feed it with with what we do and what we think and what we we dream and and yeah and yeah please contact us because we we want to join people who are in our same in our same effort no and and, and we believe that if you come to the area it's you have to come to Rio Secreto because it our mission it's to transform visitors and we do it we we really did Rio Secreto experience it's a transformation experience as a cave diver experience would be and and so it's yeah i recommend your secret definitely and and get in touch with us because it's not only a tourist attraction it's it's something more but but it's beautiful as an attraction it's beautiful and different oh beautiful well i i can't <laughs> thank you enough it's been an honor to speak with you otto and you know I can't wait I'm going to have to stop by and reacquaint myself with Rio Secreto and everything and I really encourage anyone who wants to have a unique experience to to stop by and spend some time at Rio Secreto and on today's show notes we will have links over to Rio Secreto's website and all their social media so you guys can keep in touch with everything that they're doing over there so Otto thank you so much mil gracias thank you gracias a ti hasta luego bye well, are you inspired now to move down here? Do you want to move down here and have a little place of your own? Well, then you need to talk to our friends at Bai Playa. You know, they have a friendly and knowledgeable international staff. They speak lots of languages, and they are known as being a buyer's agent. Well, what does that mean? That means they are only going to show you and sell you properties they know that have escrituras, and escritura is a title. And it's part of their due diligence to make sure the title is clear, there's no liens, and that the person who's selling the property is actually the owner. Bai Playa works with lawyers that specialize in fideicomisos, which is a Mexican trust. You may have heard of it already before. And they can address things such as capital gains problems immediately and right up front so that you have no surprises along the way to closing. So contact our friends at Bai Playa at buyplaya.com. Well, thanks for tuning in today. But before you go, just a reminder that you can visit get today's show notes at locogringo.com forward slash podcast. And if you're interested in going to Rio Secreto and you want us to make it easy for you, you can contact our concierge. Paulina can help you. Just email her concierge at locogringo.com. And if you really want to... Um, be um, an environmentally conscious traveler here in the Riviera Maya. We invite you to check out our book, The Riviera Maya Green Guide. It is available on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe. For links, show notes, and more information, head on over to LocoGringo.com or give us a call toll-free at 800-478-0081. Porque se tragó la luna, estaba enferma la rana Su madre soba que soba, dedos de pluma la panza Pensó ranita que luna, era una toronja blanca Y aunque la luna es de leche, la leche estaba cortada Croa, croa, dedos de pluma Croa, croa, dedos de agua Croa, croa de dos de pluma, croa, croa.